Hey, Keto Freaks. In case you haven't heard, Richard Morris and I are turning the entire town of New London, Connecticut, ketogenic in July 2017. Keto Fest isn't a conference. Conferences are for professionals. Festivals are for people. We will have some great speakers, yes, but also a pig roast, music, movies, cooking lessons, fitness lessons, bike tours, walking tours, and a whole lot of camaraderie among fellow Ketonians. Richard and I will both be there, as will many of our podcast guests and Facebook group admins. There's so much going on, I don't have time to tell you here. So go to ketofest.com and add your name to the mailing list so you'll know where to go and when in order to get your tickets. Keto Fest, real keto for real people. Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin in Connecticut in the United States. And in February 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm 74 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia. And I've been on a ketogenic diet for over two years. When I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've also lost about 70 pounds and I've completely turned my health around. And this show is a document of my progress through ketosis and Richard's experiences thriving for years in nutritional ketosis. Yeah. And hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah, we're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? Nah. (laughs) We have done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind them, and we hope to share some of that research. And where possible, we intend to put links in the show notes to cite the research supporting any claims that we make. You'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. Yeah, we are. We love to cook and we love to eat. In every episode, we both share a keto recipe that cannot be ignored. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Oh, you just wait. Mm. This is a good one. Mm -hmm. So, let's start podcast episode 36, Exogenous Exogenous Ketones. Ketones. Otherwise known as Sup, Dude. Sup, Dude. (laughs) Let's take some sups. (laughs) Let's take some sups. (laughs) So, Richard, do we have any corrections or apologies from last week's show? Yeah, we had a, well, actually, from Zdravko on our website. And he said, a small correction to your math. If you use or lose 1% of your body fat per day, after 100 days, you will have actually used about 65%. <laughs> so, yes, okay. that's true. That's a, an application of Zeno's paradox of Achilles and the tortoise. That's a good point. But uh, In other uh, words, the percentage goes down as the body fat goes down. Yeah, 1% get, becomes a smaller amount every every day. That's not quite what I meant. But anyway, I take your point. Yeah. You are correct, sir. That is That math is correct. <laughs> good point. All right, so let's update everybody on what a ketogenic diet is. Sure. As far as carbohydrates, it's a very low-carbohydrate diet, less than 20 grams that are only from incidental sources, preferably from green leafy vegetables, and yeah. that's about it. Maybe some nuts. Yeah. We also limit our protein, uh, that protein scales with how much lean body mass you have, and we use between 1 and 1.5 grams per kilo of lean body mass. And then the rest of it comes from fat. Pretty much. Yeah. So the idea is that when you become fat adapted, which happens after about uh, between four to eight weeks, I suppose, of eating a ketogenic diet, you'll be able to hear the signals of your body and carb cravings aren't there. So, which is really a sort of um, almost like a drug addict's response (laughs) to sugar. Yeah. You know? It is. So those aren't there. When you get hungry, you're actually hungry. And then you go to... Uh, either fatty protein or just fat first. 
And if that doesn't satisfy you, then you eat a little more protein. But uh, that's the idea. Yeah. You know how, You know what I say to people when they say, how will I know whether, when I'm fat adapted? Mm. I say, if you wake up in the morning and you're just not hungry, it means that you've had access to your body fat all night. Yeah. You're fat adapted. Yeah. You know, if you can, if you can not eat breakfast and, or maybe eat breakfast a bit later or, you know, maybe even skip breakfast entirely and have just mm. start out your day with lunch or even maybe even skip lunch. You know, you've yep. had adapted because you've been, you've been burning body fat that entire evening, that night and that morning. So, yeah. Yep. Very true. So, how was your week, buddy? Yeah, I had an awesome week. I ate pork belly the entire week. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, I got this uh, package from Costco. They were making a cut of pork belly called the yakiniku cut, which is really, I guess, Japanese grilled meat cut. It, it's kind of like bacon but uncured. Uh, so, it's the bacon rasher cut and so uh we made uh bacon soup for a couple of nights wow uh we also went out to the national press club uh with a mutual friend of ours paul and we had um we had pork belly at the pre- at the press club Jeez. and then we tonight we had cheese soup made with uh sodium citrate nice. and uh blue cheese and so we had that with um, with the pork belly, the, the fried up pork belly and zoodles, which are noodles made out of zucchini. Mm. And the night before, we had a Korean barbecue, uh, same meat again, and this time with some kimchi. So we, <laughs> we have had pork belly all week and it's been outstanding. Mm. So the other thing that uh, I've done is uh, uh, I, I made some of uh, the ramekin bread that was on our Facebook group and that was outstanding. And so what I propose to do with this ramekin bread is to make eggs benedict, which oh. is basically egg on top of egg on top of eggs with egg sauce. <laughs> That's <laughs> pretty nice. <laughs> and, a, and, a, and a little bit of ham. <laughs> <Yeah>. so, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I love eggs benedict. So the other thing that's happening this week, which has been very interesting, is that my blood sugars have been a lot higher than they have been traditionally over the past two years. Interesting. Yeah, normally my blood sugars are, are like uh, in the in the morning they can be six point one, and then most of the day they drop down to about five point two, between four point nine and five point two. That's my normal day. Millimoles per liter. That's in millimoles per liter, and I, I don't. It multiplied by 18 to get, to get yeah. the milligrams per deciliter. Yeah, yeah, sure. I don't have them off the top of my head, but I think it's like uh, 80 to 90 yeah, milligrams yeah. per deciliter, but don't quote me. Lately, for the past maybe three, two or three weeks, my morning blood sugars have been like 6.5, which is normally they, I mean, the highest they used to be is about 6.1. Mm. So that's, that's a significant um, increase, that's a 10% increase. Mm. And my daily blood sugars are in the high fives. Mm. So, um, and the interesting thing about this is you might remember that I am doing an experiment for this three-month block. Every three months I go to my doctor and get my blood test. Right. I do an experiment on every three months. And this three months I went off metformin. Oh. So I've, I've been on metformin for two for over, well, I guess maybe five years yeah. continuously as a diabetic. Um, but I went off it uh, two months ago. Yeah. So – up until about three weeks ago, I still had the low blood sugar, but then they s- slowly started to edge up. So in about uh, a month and a half's time, uh, or maybe six weeks' time, I'm going to get a blood test. We'll see what my HbA1c is like without metformin, and I suspect I'll be going back on metformin again because interesting. what I really want, I really want the low blood sugars. Yeah, isn't that interesting? I, yeah. I, I, I do hope we get to the bottom of it. That's, uh, it's a really interesting experiment and, and kudos to yeah. you for taking one for the team, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a plan for another experiment next week, which we spoke of last week. And, uh, I'll tell people more about that as we get closer to the event. And that's testing protein. Yeah. It's really interesting. There could be a bunch of things happening here. Okay. I have this theory that, you know, when you give your body something that it makes naturally, yeah. it tends to make less of it naturally. Right. And so you could have this thing happening where metformin is artificially keeping your blood sugar low. And right. so your your systems don't have to work as hard mm. to keep that same blood sugar so low. And now all of a sudden, oh, hey, wait a minute, what's this, uh, you know, so yeah. your pancreas might have to work a little harder than it's used to. Yeah, the brakes are off. But hopefully as things change and, and adjust, 
uh, so will your body. But uh, that's that's one possibility. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. One interesting thing that I have noticed in the past couple of weeks is uh, I've, I've started using my fitness pal again, which is my online food diary that I used when mm. uh, in the first 18 months of my of my keto progress, I used it religiously every day. And then I sort of got lazy and I just, I, 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 I was eating comfortably about, um, one gram per kilogram of lean body mass of, uh, of protein. And that felt a comfortable level. And so I, I sort of transitioned into a lazy keto where I, I just knew what to eat and I was eating well and my, 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 my weight was staying off and yeah. my blood sugars were staying low and everything yeah. was all, and, and all my biomarkers were coming, coming good. So, so I did that for quite a while. Now, now, I've recently started using my fitness pal again on a regular basis in the lead up to this next experiment that I'm going to do. I want to have a lead in period where I can say, here's what I ate for the four weeks prior to starting this. So, mm. cut a long story short, I've been using my fitness pal quite a lot. Yeah. And the interesting thing is, as my blood sugars went up, the natural amount of protein that I've been eating has increased to about 1.5 grams per kilogram of lean body mass. Ah. So I'm, I, I naturally increased the amount of protein as I was making more, more sugar. Huh. So, and that kind of makes sense that as I make sugar, I'm making it presumably out of uh, glycerol, but also out of uh, protein that's available. And maybe my protein stores were going a little bit low during that time. And so maybe that's, Maybe that's why I increased that a bit. And you can also look at it the other way, that the increase in blood sugar may be a result of, of eating more protein than you normally do. So, they, one could feed the other. That's a very good point. Because we know this is a vicious cycle, right? I mean, we know that it, it is. is with carbohydrates anyway. Why wouldn't it be with protein? Right. So, as you know, I'm going to do this experiment in the next block, and that's going to be eating at the nutrient reference value, and that's a low-protein level. So, yeah. it's going to be interesting, and I'm going to do a DEXA scan at the at bookending that, right. that three-month process. So, yeah. we, we're going to know exactly how much lean body mass that I've lost yeah. eating at the Australian reference value. And then I'll have, probably have to work out very hard to, to regain some of my, my lean body mass yeah. if I have lost any. Right. So that is going to be interesting because I'm going to be maintaining a low protein. I'm going to be intentionally doing that. I'm going to be preparing my meals at the beginning of every day and I'm going to be laying out exactly what I'm going to eat. Yeah. And for three months. And yeah. so that's going to be interesting to see what, what my blood sugar does in that period. Very interesting. Yeah. So how was your week, Carl? My week was great. I had a good time. Awesome. I made another Cuban pernil pork roast. Mm, I saw the, I saw the pictures. Yeah. And I've eaten a lot of chocolate mousse and whipped cream. I basically increased my fat intake and you know i put on a couple pounds but i don't care <laughs> <laughs> well it's 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 uh it's full time there right yeah Thanksgiving, yeah, so yeah everybody's gonna be putting on putting on a bit of body weight yeah and you know the fact is, is that it comes off easier than it goes on has been my experience <laughs> it's so well, you know the trick now too <laughs> yeah exactly so i've just been enjoying uh some rich food and uh and i'm you know i'm not craving it um i'm just enjoying it so nice. yeah i'll probably i'm gonna go on the zorn fast that'll be fun oh awesome yeah i'm gonna do that too mm -hmm. on the 20th this is on the 20th we're gonna start that and i think i'm probably gonna do a five-day fast and then i'm gonna do my experiment with the uh with eating some protein to break my fast and and compare it to last yeah. last month's zorn fast and don't get me wrong i'm still Low, like my weight is still. I'm, I've lost seventy four pounds. Like I'm, I'm uh, still at a really good weight. So uh, it's mm. slowly going down. But you know, I bumped it up a couple of pounds this week. Yeah. Um, my mother, of all people, who I told you has been a sort of a low fat Nazi for a long time. You know, <laughs> <laughs> she's just, just okay. a typical, you know, seventy plus year old. Mm -hmm. You know, came of age in the fifties and was all about the low fat and and all that. Yeah, and so yeah. it's very hard for her to 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 get it. Um, but she did send me this article from Time Magazine, and I'm going to link to this. Mm. And she told me in the subject, for what it's worth. In other words, I know you're not going to listen to this, but I'm going to send it to you anyway, <laughs> right? Anyway, yeah. And so, this is an article from October 11th, 2016. So, this just came out mm -hmm. three days ago before recording this. It's time to rethink high-protein diets for weight loss. And uh, it's about a new study that suggests there's a downside to all that protein, mm -hmm. which is interesting because that's what we've been talking about lately as well. Yeah. However, I want you to listen to what they did in this study. 
I'm just going to read this because it's very short. Eating Mm. a diet that's high in protein is often recommended for people trying to lose weight since high protein foods make people feel more full, preventing overeating. However, a new study suggests that while the diet may help people slim down, it doesn't necessarily improve other health problems under the hood. In a small study, researchers at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis followed 34 postmenopausal women with obesity for about six months. Okay. The women were split into three groups, and here's mm-hmm. where it gets interesting. Mm-hmm. One group kept their diet the same. One group went on a calorie-restricted weight loss diet with a daily recommended amount of protein. Mm-hmm. And a third group went on the same diet but also increased their protein intake by about 150 to 250 calories. So they had more total calories. And more total calories, they had more protein, but didn't say anything about carbohydrates. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or, or fat. Now, like I right. imagine a calorie-restricted uh, weight loss diet is probably, and I haven't looked at the study, but it's probably a low-fat diet. Yeah, yeah, it'd be 40, 40% carbs, 30, 30% uh, protein, 30% fat. Yeah. Exactly. So the article goes on, the researchers provided all the meals for the women, and besides mm-hmm. the increased protein, the diets were virtually the same. The study found that while both groups of women, and I imagine they mean both interventions, not the yeah. control group, sure. were able to lose about 10% of their body weight, the women who ate more protein experienced no changes in their insulin sensitivity, which is important for overall health. Mm. Improved insulin sensitivity is important to cut down on a person's risk for type 2 diabetes, which is common in people with obesity. It's one of the reasons weight loss is recommended for a better health in the first place. Uh, the women who lost weight without increasing the amount of protein, they had experienced a 25 to 30% improvement in insulin sensitivity. But the women who ate more protein experienced no change in insulin sensitivity. Wow. Yeah. So, a couple of things. A, I really want to look at this study to find out what the macros were on their diet because, um, you know, higher protein or no higher protein, if they're eating uh, carbohydrates, that is a is a problem right there yeah, but sure. the fact that uh higher protein in this diet um didn't you know prevented insulin sensitivity is mm. an interesting outcome yeah i know that uh that steve Phineas said there's no evidence that greater than 2.5 grams per kilogram of lean body mass uh produces any benefit right um and and jeff volick has said that uh up to 3 uh, is definitely fine, and I've seen studies that are, that show up to, I think about three point nine um, uh, athletes uh, having up to three point nine mm. um, grams per kilogram of lean body mass um, were fine, no kidney problems, no liver problems. Mm-hmm. There is an upper limit. Um, it's called rabbit starvation, yeah. and that's where you know if if we if you eat only protein, um, you'll die from rabbit starvation, and that's just because uh, our livers and kidneys just can't process the amount of uh, protein that's required to create the calories that we need to run through a day. It's really interesting you brought that up. I was watching an episode of QI last night. You know QI oh, okay. is? With, uh, <laughs> I do know QI, yeah. Yeah, Stephen QI, Fry. yeah, yep. exactly. I think I'd enjoy that game. I'd like to play that. <laughs> I would too. Stephen Fry is the host, and uh, I, I think they're off the air now. But this was season five, I think, and I'm not okay. sure where it came up. But mm. there's one of the questions was about people who uh, were out on a hunt and Mm -hmm. were eating rabbits, only rabbits. Okay. And it turns out if you eat only rabbits, you'll die. Yeah, that's it. That's the rabbit starvation. The rabbit starvation, yeah. And so what it is, it's all protein. There's no fat Mm. or very, very, very little fat on a rabbit. And so, and, and what he said was that if you don't eat some vegetables with it and get other nutrients... The, wow. the the process of eating protein and digesting protein will suck all of those vitamins and nutrients out of what nutrition is <laughs> in your body, and no. you'll essentially <laughs> die that way. And I thought that was a little strange. That's not the mechanism. Yeah, of course no, that's not. not the mechanism. Of course not. But uh, I, th- I thought it was great because people don't understand, uh, yeah. you know, they think that they have to eat peas and carrots. That I know. But the thing is, if you eat carrots, if you eat the rabbits with with the carrots- the carrots provide glucose, so you need to 
you need to oxidize less protein to create your energy and maybe you, maybe you've uh, you're under the threshold that that uh, kills your kidneys and, you, and yeah. your, your liver so yeah it's yeah. defraying the energy that you need to get out of protein. Boy, it's really interesting, though, isn't it? <laughs> but it's a, it's those it's those vitamins and minerals. <laughs> yeah, if you don't get the vitamins and minerals from your carrots, yeah, those rabbits are going to kill you. All that protein. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So anyway, um, I'm being I'm being sarcastic there, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. All right, now that we know how we were this week, let's find out how everybody else is and read some mail. <laughs> 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 Mail, mail, mail. <laughs> we need we need to make an app that's a soundboard of just you and me just going mail. Okay, consider it <laughs> let's done. Do that. I can do that. Let's do that. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> so let's uh, let's find out who's talking to us. This one was from Facebook. Uh, that's where a yeah. lot of our mail comes from. And Alex yeah. said, "Had a great non-scale victory. Mm. It wasn't even mine. Wow. <laughs> I work at a gym and had a gentleman told to speak." to me two months ago mm-hmm. he was told he is pre-diabetic with an a1c of 6.4 ouch and his triglycerides at 184 ouch so well not terrible no but, but he's on the way he's on the slippery slope isn't he he's on the slippery slope mm. i told him what i knew pointed him to the podcast and today he told me he got his blood work back a1c is five triglycerides 86 oh yeah so awesome to hear this drop the mic <laughs> <laughs> Drop the mic. This is exactly what we want to happen yeah. with this community. We want people helping each other. That's the whole idea. Yeah. Our initial goal was to try and get Carl right. Yeah. And then to help the people who are listening to us. And then once they've got themselves right, is to empower them to help their friends. The podcast is something you can point people at. Yeah. The blog, something, and the Facebook group. Yeah, these are all resources. And our goal is to basically start a revolution. And it's free. This is like a multi-level marketing scheme without the marketing (laughs) or without the money. Yeah, without the money. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. It's kind of paying it forward, I guess. So uh, this is awesome. Thank you very much, Alex. That's probably That made my day, that story, because once we've got all of our listeners healthy, we want them to um, uh, help their friends and family. Exactly. So we have a second uh, uh, message. This one is from Keisha, and she says, I have a question about fat for those who don't eat pork. Mm. I see lots of pics of pork rinds and the like. Mm. Uh, what are the fat snacks to eat for non-pork eaters for religious reasons? Yeah. And we had a few nasty comments from people saying learn to enjoy pork, which yeah, is come not on. very helpful. Don't and, do that. Yeah, come on, come on people. <laughs> uh, so so I'm going to do a recipe later on today uh, during our recipe segment to show you how to make beef bacon. Ooh. Um, yeah, and it's delicious. Of it's, course it is. It's as good as pork bacon. All right. I'm and thinking brisket, like a smoked fatty piece it's exactly of beef. It. Yeah. And and sliced up fine. I mean, yeah. it's, cure cure a, a raw brisket, cure it. And I use some Australian spices, um, which may be difficult for some people to get. But we'll do that. I'll do that in the recipe. I won't go into much more detail about that. So there's other options, obviously. Um, anything with heavy whipping cream or coconut oil as mm-hmm. a base. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of fat bombs out there, savory fat bombs, sweet fat bombs, you know, with sweetener if you want it. Um, my yeah. go-to lately is chocolate mousse, which has proven to be a hit over and over and over again <laughs> with uh, listeners of this podcast. There's one thing that I like doing when I get a chook is to to pull the skin off in one piece, and then I'll uh, you know I'll, I'll I'll roast the chook um, or cut it up into into um, into cuts and and make a casserole out of it or whatever. Mm. But I take the I take the skin and put it between two sheets of baking paper. And put those between two sh- cookie trays, and put that in the oven and cook it low and slow. Now, what do you mean by chook? Oh, a chicken. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, my my Aussie came out. Ah. So if I ever say chook, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's Australian for a chicken. <laughs> I gotta think that you can go to your butcher and say, "Give me your skins and fat scraps." And you would hope so, wouldn't you? Yeah, and they they throw that stuff out. People hate the skin. I'm gonna try that. Yeah, I've I've gotten leaf lard before from uh, which is the the. Fat around the kidneys of a, of a pig mm. that just gets thrown away, and that's the that's the best fat you know, yeah. on the entire pig. 
Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, so, so what I do is I, uh, I use uh, chicken skin and I put it between two layers of baking paper and put that between two cookie trays, put it in the oven and cook it low and slow. And what that does is it crisps it up and then you can use it like crackers, which is chicken skin with the chicken fat on it. Wow. It's delicious. That is delicious. Oh, so good. <laughs> yeah. I'm, like I said, I made that pernil, that pork shoulder, which is the picnic oh, yeah. shoulder with the, with the skin yeah. on it. And the yeah. cracklings were so good, but oh. but they were so hard to chew. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> you really got to crisp them up. Yeah, you need to you need to slice them up into small pieces while they're still soft, and then crisp them oh, later on. I'm sorry, we're talking about pork again. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you know what's also good? Lamb. Yeah, lamb is delicious. A good lamb shoulder. Yeah, would be just as good as pork sure. or goat. I, I I've only just gotten into eating goat. It's spectacular. Are you kidding so, me? Ha, get oh, it. it's delicious. Get it. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Some of the best goat I had was in Barcelona at this restaurant called Cuatro Gatos. Four cats. Yeah, four cats. And it was a <laughs> roast leg of kid, which is a baby goat. And yeah. I, I, you know, for five seconds, I was really upset about it being a baby yeah. goat for five seconds. And then it was, <gasps> oh, <laughs> my it God, it was, delicious. It was so good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love. I mean, lamb is lamb is the same, veal's the same. Yeah, just, yeah. yeah. All right, so Stephen, uh, and this is our good friend Stephen. He's a friend of mine. Um, also listens to .NET Rocks, which is my programming show. And he says, nice. "Good morning, everyone." So I have an update of sorts. I went keto a little under two months ago, and have had mm -hmm. some great success. Now, first awesome. of all, I got to tell you about Stephen. He came mm -hmm. down to see me at the studio with his kids and his wife a couple of years ago because they just wanted to see the studio and make, make some stuff. And we went out to lunch. And this was before I started keto, but after I had my diabetes. Uh, right. Yeah. So, we, we talked so about it. So, you knew it. you were sick. You were sick and you knew And you I was were, on metformin. Yeah. And he says, yeah, metformin's okay. Just fatty liver. I'm worried about that. So he was talking about, he's also diabetic, right? Right. And yeah. so we really sort of started talking about it back then. But mm -hmm. then he found out about what I did with keto and uh, I got him started and here's, here's the results. So he says, six and a half years ago, I converted to Judaism. Don't mm -hmm. worry. This isn't primarily a religious post. <laughs> okay. All right. Yesterday was Yom Kippur and fasting yeah. is a big part of participating in the day. Mm. Because I am type 2 diabetic and not on keto in the past, I wasn't able to fast. My doctor and rabbi strongly urged against it. So, for the first time in the years since converting, I was able to fast on Yom Kippur. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For me, this is a huge non-scale victory. Sure. Just like Carl Franklin and Richard Morris have mentioned on the podcast, I ran into a little challenge at about the 18-hour mark. But isn't that funny how that happens? Yeah, it happens for everyone. But it's 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 not a blip if you know it's coming. Yeah, and it gets the the more often you fast, the less less of a blip it becomes. Yeah, so I think it's just mental. Yeah, probably. Well, we'll see. Uh, so he ran into the challenge at eighteen hour mark, but overall it was an easy twenty four hour fast. Nice, that's awesome. I, I could I could see what was coming up here because as soon as I hear somebody talking about fasting, it's like it, it's like Br'er Rabbit and the Briar Patch, yeah. isn't it? You know? Yeah. <laughs> no, don't make me fast. Yeah, yeah right. That's <laughs> true. What are you guys doing? You're going to kill yourselves. Yeah. Um, well, Larry commented on this, and he says this is kind of an interesting philosophical quandary. The one-day fast on Yom Kippur is supposed to focus our thoughts in directions different from everyday life. Mm. But now I have several days a week in which I normally don't eat for 20 <laughs> hours, and I've done three-day fasts. 24 yeah. hours is like nothing. It's like nothing. <laughs> Except for the caffeine withdrawal, but I started cutting back sure. two weeks early to make that easier. Should yeah. I be fasting for a longer period to make the fast more meaningful <laughs> so you want to time it so that whatever your pb is maybe your, your personal best is eight an eight day fast you want to make sure that the ninth day is yom kippur so yeah. you're in uncharted territory <laughs> yeah that's really crazy huh i mean what a what a quandary but what a what a luxurious problem huh i know what a superpower we have a superpower i mean just think about yourself before you did keto yeah. can you imagine not eating for Five days or seven I days. I couldn't imagine or... not eating for five hours. I know. I couldn't do it. 
I used to get panicky about the fasts that I have to take before a blood test. Yeah. So we have a, another message from Alison who says, I know this is old school talking, but mm-hmm. I still have old dietary rules ringing in my head. Is it okay to eat eggs daily? Yes, next question. <laughs> and it's, Really, it is. Eggs are awesome. Yeah. You can grow an entire chook from an egg. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise known as a chicken. Otherwise known as a chicken. <laughs> AKA yeah. chicken. And of course, we know that eating cholesterol doesn't raise your cholesterol very much unless you're a rabbit. Yeah, that we learned that from Ansel Keys, who right. uh, said there is no connection whatsoever be- between cholesterol in food and cholesterol in blood, and we've known that all along. Cholesterol in the diet doesn't matter at all unless you happen to be a chicken or a rabbit. Wait a minute, Ansel Keys said that? Yes, yes, Ansel Keys said that in 1997. Oh, oh, this was the one that he tried to retract. His theory was you eat saturated fat, it makes you make more cholesterol, that gives you a heart attack. And- People saw cholesterol heart attack, let's make everyone eat margarine because it lowers their cholesterol. And he was saying, it's not the cholesterol that you eat that causes the problem, it's the stuff that saturated fat is causing you to make. I, wow, I, I didn't know that. I mean, I mean, I guess I knew that, but I didn't. Mm. I knew that he tried to later on tell people a uh, heart hypothesis was wrong and nobody would publish it. Yeah. I know that yeah, was that, true. This might have been the era because that was 97, that was just- yeah. uh, that was just eight years before he died. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's the Ansel Keys. Wow. That one. Wow. <laughs> the, the father of the diet heart hypothesis literally said, there is no connection whatsoever between cholesterol in food and cholesterol in blood. And we've known that all along. Cholesterol in the diet doesn't matter at all unless you happen to be a chicken or a rabbit. In other words, a vegetarian. Yeah. Not able to process fat. There was science done around about the turn of the century of the previous entry in Russia, Aniskov, I think the scientist's name You're was. You're talking about the rabbits. The rabbits, yeah. yeah. He, f- he fed high cholesterol food to rabbits and they got heart disease and, yeah. and atherosclerosis and that. Right. And they became a model for us to study the development of atherosclerosis because you can make them so easily yeah. have cardiovascular disease. And the only way that, that people were able to stop them from having cardiovascular disease when you fed them this food was to prevent them from making insulin. And so nobody thought, hey, maybe we ought to try this on an omnivore. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Maybe maybe we shouldn't be feeding herbivores meat. <laughs> maybe there's a reason they don't like meat, because it kills them. All right, uh, enough about that craziness. Grace says, yeah. has anyone used or heard of this product? Looking for more info on the ingredients and how it actually works in the keto diet. And the product is Prove It, P-R-U-V-I-T, keto slash O-S. I think they have an umlaut over the U. Prove It. Prove It. Prove It. <laughs> I don't know. Well, um, I, don't know. Uh, I can't tell you how many times somebody has brought this up to us because it's a, it's a big multi-level marketing company. Yep. And uh, it's one brand of exogenous ketones which happens to be the topic that we're talking about today yeah and uh people have varieties of opinions on this but we do as well we do and the first opinion that we got was from the cancer show mark miller yeah who had prostate cancer Mm. did some research and found out that taking exogenous ketones will actually help as a therapy yeah when trying to shrink uh, tumors. You see, somebody who has cancer, they're trying to deny cancer uh, the environment to live. What they apparently need to do is to get their glucose ketone index to one to one ratio. Mm. So have as much glucose as you have ketones in your body. So, um, for example, if you have uh, 3.5 millimoles of glucose, approximately 3.5 millimoles of ketones, you have a ketone, a glucose ketone index of one. Okay. That, and that's supposedly the ideal environment to d- deny cancer, the, the food that it needs to, to multiply and grow. All right. So people take these ketone supplements. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Yes, that's true. And so, what is the number one reason people take these? So, I would, I, I would say that the number one reason people take these is because they think it has a benefit for weight loss. Okay. And that is if, you know, it's, it's a little bit uh, cargo cultish in that you see people on a ketogenic diet, the diet causes you to make ketones, you can see those ketones because you urinate them out, mm. and people who are on that diet lose a lot of weight. And so, wouldn't it be great if you could just eat ketones and you'd be able to pee them out and you'd be able to prove that you've got the, 
the, the ketone power happening right. and you'd have all of the benefits of ketones, uh, mental clarity and the focus and, and the quote unquote weight loss. But there's really two things happening here, isn't there? That's right. In a ketogenic diet, you have the process that creates ketones. That process has benefits in and of itself. That's right. And then you have the ketones themselves as a therapy. In other words, what are the therapeutic effects of just having ketones in your blood? And those are two yeah. different things. Yeah. The point for us uh, for the ketogenic diet is not having ketones, it's making ketones. Well, it's, it's both, isn't it? Well, there is some signaling involved in, in having ketones in your blood, but the whole point of uh, making ketones is burning body fat to right. make ketones. Right. You're not going to lose any weight if you eat ketones. That's right. Because you're adding energy into your system. Right. So we, we all agree we want ketones because they feed our brain, they feed our organs, they, they, oh, yeah. they, they are good therapeutically. However, yeah. if weight loss is your goal, your best bet is to limit your carbohydrates or lower insulin so that you can burn body fat. Make them. Which makes the ketones. And makes them for free. And makes them for free. Yeah. And it's analogous, as we have said on the show a couple of times, of uh, taking an Uber to the finish line of a race. Yeah. And squirting sweat on yourself and saying, look at me, I won, you know. Yeah, giving yourself a, a crisp high five for, <laughs> <laughs> for an awesome workout. Right. You know, you, you get yeah. the benefit of having sweat on yourself skin which does cool you off yes there's a therapeutic yeah. uh, thing there but you didn't actually get any exercise yeah and there's also another benefit for diabetics if you make ketones you're in a low insulin state yeah if you eat ketones you can you can have ketones with a pasta bolognese right and that's not going to do anything for your glucose level or your insulin level therefore or your insulin level that's right so the other thing is once you have high levels of insulin in your blood, you're driving glucose into your cells, that glucose is competing with the ketones for access to the to the Krebs cycle, the inside your mitochondria. So you're going to be using less ketones, so you're going to be peeing out more. So the, if you eat ketones and you're not eating a low-carb diet, then you will be literally peeing expensive pee. <laughs> um, some people say now... That every time they cheat, for example, right. they take some exogenous ketones to quell their hunger yeah. to get back into ketosis. And I know that Tom Seast in our admin group has tried that a couple of times hmm. and never saw any difference in terms of his hunger or... It extends the period necessary to get back into ketosis. So right. it, it's actually it's actually a pointless, pointless goal. Counterproductive. The, yeah, so it's uh, good for example for people who have Alzheimer's, elderly people uh, for whom it would be almost impossible to get them onto a low carb diet because right. there's so many it's access to so many carbohydrates that yeah. would just knock them out too quickly and yeah, then yeah. you know the uh, the symptoms set back in again. Mm. So for people who have Alzheimer's, people who have Parkinson's for example, uh, there's very good evidence that uh it provides a backup method for fueling their brain hmm. for when glucose is prevented from, from doing the job. So uh, that's another benefit. And there's a fourth category, and that's really Olympic-level athletes. And that's an entire uh, rabbit hole that we probably don't have time to go down today. But basically, an Olympic-level ath athlete uh, can use uh, ketones to provide them a, a, a third source of energy during uh, during their competition. Now, when you say Olympic level, does that mean what if I'm lifting for two hours a day and running for two hours a day? Was that would that be considered Olympic level? I mean, what if you're just a a hard pushing exercising machine? Yeah, it might give you a little bit of extra energy, uh, but there are significant safety concerns with ketones. And this is probably the most critical thing for me. The ketones that are on the market currently are molecules that are racemic. Now, I need to talk a little bit about the structure of, of chemistry, okay. the structure of molecules. And before you do that, we need to say that they're usually accompanied by a salt of some kind. Yes, that's right. They're all ketone salts. Sodium, potassium, magnesium, or calcium. Okay. That's, that's right. And it's normally beta-hydroxybutyrate that's um, attached to these mineral ions. Okay. So that beta-hydroxybutyrate 
is manufactured uh i suspect it's manufactured from corn but it's it's basically manufactured in a big vat uh using chemical processes and what that produces is something called a racemic mix now i need to go into detail about uh, about isomers here so i apologize for the little sidebar on chemistry but lay it on us okay a good example of isomers is glucose and fructose they both contain exactly the same elements but they're configured in a different way and they have entirely different behaviors. So they're molecules that have the same number of atoms of different elements, That's right. but they're arranged differently. Exactly. So some chemical processes can create isomers that are called stereoisomers. And I think the best analogy I can give have you ever played Tetris? Of course. So you have the bar, you have the square, you have the T, and you got the L's. So that's the four categories. And you can spin them around. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing is the L. There's actually two different kinds of L's. One right. goes bends in one direction, the other bends in the other direction. So if you're right. dropping one of these L's down, and you're spinning it around, and the slot underneath it is for the other kind of L, you're going to end up with a massive big hole in your, <laughs> in your arrangement. All right, yeah. It just doesn't fit, right? Yeah. So, but but it's an L. It should fit. It's an L, but right. it's the wrong shape L. These are what you call stereoisomers. This is huh. and, and beta hydroxybutyrate makes stereoisomers when one is the left handed shape and the other is the right handed shape. Okay. Well, it turns out that physiologically we only make the right handed shape of isomer. And we've evolved to make this. We've evolved to use it for energy. When there's no carbohydrates in our diet, it's how we fuel our brains for, I guess, two million years. This is what yeah. we've been doing. As long as we've been eating meat and as long as we've been living away from the equator and mm -hmm. not living on fruit and, and yeah. the like, this is, this is essentially what we, uh, we've been making the right handed isomer of beta hydroxybutyrate when there's no carbs around. Got it. Well, the interesting thing is that these chemical processes that make this beta hydroxybutyrate make both the left handed and the right handed form. Mm. And the left handed form, we don't know what to do with. So it turns out that we do actually have a mechanism for dealing with it. And I want to discuss two pieces of science here. The first is from uh, Alison Robinson and Dermot Williamson in 1980. And their study was physiological roles of ketone bodies as substrates and signals in mammalian tissue. That will be ours. That's it. Um, we are mammals. And so they say that the presently known pathway of utilization of the left-handed form is different from that of the right-handed form. Since beta-hydroxybutyrate dehydrogenase, which is an enzyme necessary to, to use, uh, beta, use the ketone for energy, mm. is specific to the right-handed form. Oh. So it won't convert the left-handed form to be used for energy. And there's no evidence for any existence of a mitochondrial left-handed form of this enzyme. Uh, or, and there's no racemase, which is an enzyme that converts from one, one form to the other to convert from the left-handed to the right-handed form. So really, do we know about what effect the left-handed form has on our physiology or is it just discarded? It's well, they, they have actually suspect they, they have suggested that the pathway of utilization of the left handed form may involve conversion into a, uh, intermediary called L hydroxybutyryl CoA. And then that can be oxidized into, uh, L3 hydroxyacyl CoA, which can, can then be used to form acetyl CoA, which is the, Basically, it turns back into the fuel, goes back into the top of the process, and then gets passed through as fuel. So mm. there are four different steps there involved in converting this weird alien left-handed form of beta-hydroxybutyrate right. into something that we can use for energy. And are most and of these products uh, containing both, you said, in equal amounts, yeah. both left and right? They have, yeah, 50-50 mix. Okay. And if they say beta-hydroxybutyrate, then it's a 50-50 mix. If they say D-beta-hydroxybutyrate, then it's just the correct physiological form. Then it's the right-handed. It's the right-handed one, yeah. Okay. So uh, there's another study also by Brunengraber who did tracer experiments where he did a radioisotope trace on the L form, which is the weird alien form, mm -hmm. and he was able to watch it go through and, and see it come back up out as acetyl-CoA, which is the generic form of fuel, and then go into the system to be converted into energy. So mm. we know that 
in small amounts, at least in the amounts that were done in the tracer experiments, that that actually does happen. So it turns in energy, but it doesn't give you the therapeutic benefits that uh, the, is the reason that we take ketones in the first place. Yes, potentially it may. We're not sure. Nobody's done the test. Oh, okay. There's got to be a lot of money thrown at this to actually know that for a fact. And there's not a lot of money involved in this other than multi-level marketing schemes, apparently. So... I've got a few questions about this, and the first question is, can the pathways that we're talking about here handle caloric amounts? Right. We know that we can radioisotope tag a couple of molecules, push it through, and see what happens to them. But we're talking about sort of 80 grams a day of beta-hydroxybutyrate that you need to run your brain. Yeah. So, you know, c can these pathways handle that kind of amount, a caloric amount of these things? Mm. Um, and the other question is, what – is that displacing? I mean, what were these pathways doing previously that now they have to deal with alien uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate? Mm. And then the third thing is, is there any contention for transport that could impact other critical molecules? So maybe these things coming through the gate are stopping other things coming through. So there's three questions that nobody really knows the answer to, and it would be very, extremely expensive to do the science to know this for a fact. Mm. So all we really have is we know that people aren't dying when they eat this stuff, so it's mm -hmm. probably safe. Mm -hmm. And that there's been three incidences where um, it's been given to kids who would have died otherwise if they didn't have some energy from, from ketones mm -hmm. and th they had a special disease where they needed – this was the only way they could get energy. Well, okay. And and they were given this racemic 50-50 mix and they didn't die. So, you know, that's uh, – so obviously they were getting energy – Required okay. energy to survive from it. So, so our position based on this science is that if you're trying to be in nutritional ketosis to lose weight and to reverse type 2 diabetes, that you're better off just going on a ketogenic diet. Absolutely. And letting your ketones happen naturally for free. As you say, this is like spraying some sweat on your face and, and giving yourself a crisp high five for mm. a great workout. You know, it, you haven't, you haven't worked out to get there. And it's not really a moral issue. It's more of a biochemical issue yeah. that if you produce ketones because you have low glucose, low carbohydrate coming in, your blood sugar is controlled by making your own glucose. And so for a diabetic, this means that you get glycostasis. You, mm. you, you don't have, high excursions of blood sugar. If you eat ketones to get, you know, the mental clarity and focus and appetite control. Sure. But you still have high insulin, you still have glucose going all over the place, you've got none of the benefits for a diabetic. And as far as I'm concerned, as a as a type 2 diabetic myself, um, the biggest benefit is glucose control because, you know, toes are better than French fries. Um, hey. <laughs> <laughs> and Carl's wearing the shirt I'm right wearing, now. I'm wearing the shirt. <laughs> so is there any form of ketones that we should be eating? In other words, uh, taking exogenously or we can to assist in our uh, weight loss? Yeah, I think there's actually, other than making it yourself, there's actually two other sources of ketones that I think would be appropriate to eat. And the first is there are some ketone esters that have been created that are only the D form of uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate. It's an ester with a butandiol, I believe, molecule. I, uh, I'll errata this if I got it wrong. But basically that butandiol then, two of those molecules will combine to become a third beta-hydroxybutyrate. So, so two molecules of this um, uh, ketone ester becomes three molecules of beta-hydroxybutyrate. There was a post by Chris Kelly, who's an elite level cyclist who also podcasts, mm -hmm. and he says that he took some uh, of this ketone ester from, I believe it was T delta S um, uh, ketone ester, but it was the one made by uh, Dr. Veach and Clark from uh, from Oxford University. And uh his ketones went straight up to 6.2 millimoles per litre uh, within seconds after taking this, and it was like rocket fuel. Whereas when he took the uh, the other product, the salt, it went up to 1.9 millimoles per litre. So huh. that indicates that he's getting basically three molecules where he'd only get one molecule with the other. Hmm. So that probably indicates that the, the ketone salts are probably a very inefficient form of ketones anyway, um, hmm. safety issues aside. 
these particular ketone esters have been shown with uh, for UK rowers, Olympic level rowers, uh, they were able to establish a two percent increase in their personal best performances on indoor rowing machines. Mm. So you can imagine if you go to an a, to a, an Olympic level performer and offer them a two percent increase in their performance, you know, yeah, that that it's a no brainer, no brainer. Really, you know, so because all you need and, is two percent edge to win. That's the gold medal right there. Yeah. So and and we do know that Britain did very well in the rowing this year. So uh, so who knows? And also the cyclists as well. But could those Olympic athletes do just as well without taking ketone esters? In other words, just eating a well formulated ketogenic diet? I'm not sure. I'm not sure because I th- I believe that they're both they're using both glucose and ketones and fat as sources of energy. Mm. They have all three sources in abundance when they do their and it's the same with the uh, the Tour de France level uh, cyclists. I mean the, these guys, the fat adapted cyclists who are doing this, are, are also taking uh, gels which have got um, carbohydrates okay. and right. and they're filling their glycogen beforehand. So that's that's one mechanism. And the other mechanism, so the ketone esters is one that I would recommend. Yeah, yeah, the other yeah. me- mechanism is eating medium chain triglycerides, like coconut oil, like coconut oil, or yeah. like uh, MCT oil or uh, brain octane. So um, and the, the the mechanism for how that works, you're not actually eating ketones; you're eating fats. But these fats are, that are medium chain or small chain fats. They go straight to your liver. Yeah. So I need to have a slight sidebar to discuss how fats get digested. Okay. We could probably break down fats into two categories, medium and short chain fats and long chain fats. Right. Let's call them the shorter chain fats. Okay. The shorter chain fats, they go straight across the gut wall. They go straight into the portal vein, nothing but liver. So they go basically go straight to the liver and then they get processed by the liver and the shorter chain fats – or go straight into the mitochondria of liver cells. They don't have to jump through a lot of hoops that the long chain fats have to go through. Okay. If it's numerous enough, it can overwhelm the supply of a, of oxaloacetate and that spills ketones. Okay. The long chain fats have a different pathway. And these typically are the saturated fats from meats and things, right? Or polyunsaturators that are longer than 12 chains of carbon. Anything that's longer than 12 chains. Okay. In fact, the 12 chain of carbon fat goes in both directions. It can both go directly to the liver and it also goes through this longer process. So it's like an, it's like a, 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 a midway um, molecule that goes both directions. Okay. So the long chain fats, they go into the enterocytes in the gut wall and they get clustered together in fatty globules and they get a protein wrapper put around them okay. and they get shipped out, lipoprotein wrapper, and they get shipped out as a massive lipoprotein called a chylomicron, and they basically get shipped via the lymph and they skip the liver and they go to the rest of the body first and then they come back to the liver as chylomicron remnants. And the other important thing about these long-chain fats, so they, they don't go straight to the liver, they go to everyone else first and they yep. go to your fat cells and you, if your fat cells are buying, they'll pick up. If uh, your muscle cells are buying fat, <laughs> fatty acids, they'll pick up as well. Okay. So any, any, any consumers will, will, will suck the fat out of these uh, chylomicrons and then whatever's left over goes to the liver for processing. Got it. And then the liver gets to look after it. Now, the other interesting thing about the long-chain fats is that when insulin is high, your mitochondria can't get these long chain fats in there. It requires something called a carnitine shuttle, which is inhibited by insulin. So if you're, if you have sugar in your diet, you can use all those medium and short chain fats. They'll go straight in. They're not inhibited, but your long chain fats won't be able to be used for energy. And because really you, if your insulin is high, your job is to use all the glucose first. That's, right. that's why insulin went high. So, um, so the thing about these medium and short chain fatty acids is that you can use these even when you have it high insulin, high glucose. And so I would recommend for people who are going through the process of keto adaptation to eat coconut oil or brain octane or uh, any of these uh, medium chain MCT oils uh, in the early stages because you can still make ketones even though you have, you know, moderate levels of insulin. Okay. I guess you could think of uh, the medium and short chain fats a little bit like glucose is compared to where, where long chain fats are more like your starches. So Got it. It's a little bit more effort to break them apart and, and utilize them. Okay. All right. Well, so that, you know, it's not a completely black and white issue then apparently. No. 
Well, I would certainly, I would certainly supplement with coconut oil. In fact, I do right now. Yeah, I, so do I. I will eat coconut oil, and that will give me a lot of the benefits that I would get if I had uh, ketones. If I if I was eating ketones, uh, I, I'm going to get those benefits just from eating coconut oil, and it's cheap, and I know that it's going to be the right kind of ketones too. Yeah. So there is something else we need to address, which is the whole multi-level marketing aspect of this. Oh, yeah. We consider people who are pushing this, uh, these exogenous ketones in our Facebook group spammers. Absolutely. So don't do that. Yeah, don't. That's a good way to get kicked out of our group. <laughs> we've, we've been playing whack-a-mole with, uh, yeah. with uh, people because every, they're all trying to sell ketones to their friends. And what they're doing is they're conflating the benefits of making ketones with the fact of having ketones. Right. So the theory is, you know, you eat these ketones, hey, you pee them out on a on a ketone stick, it turns dark purple. Yeah. You know, give yourself a high five because you're obviously losing weight. Well, no, no, you're not. There are other groups that you can go to where, you know, the application of ketone therapies would be appropriate, like a dementia, Alzheimer's, cancer. Absolutely. Uh, or Olympic athletes. And, uh, yeah. you know, go there. I would recommend waiting until the uh, physiological form of ketones are available on the market, the ketone esters. Yeah. All right. Well, we're running a little bit long today, so let's get right to our recipes. 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 All right, dude, you're first. Beef bacon. Beef bacon, yeah. We made a special order the other day from our butcher for an entire beef belly. And we cut it into slabs and put it into culinary trays. And I guess we, it was about uh, a kilo and a half per tray. And we used the same method that we used for making bacon, which you can also find on my on my blog. Yeah. So we cured it with Prague powder number one, and we used various herbs to rub into it uh, to impart flavour. And uh, one we rubbed with uh, two Aussie herbs, uh, native bush spices. One is called lemon myrtle, yeah. which has kind of got a flavour like lemongrass, okay. but it's like lemongrass times 100. Ooh. It, 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 and it, it's just leaves of what looks like a gum tree and these things just smell is just spectacular. So it was like this lemongrass and then we used uh, – the other spice we used was roast wattle seed, which is uh, – the wattle is actually Australia's national floral symbol. No kidding. Uh, but – uh, it is. And these are going to be almost impossible for you to f find in America. I apologize for that. So we did the lemon myrtle and roast wattle seed. We did a plain one, which is just salt. And we did a third one, which was a mixture of four different kinds of pepper. We used black pepper, or I guess pepper berries, Szechuan pepper berries, mm. green pepper berries, Ooh. and an Australian native pepper berry called the pepper berry. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, but it's a it's a it's a highly potent form of pepper. But um, ah. so uh, so then we smoke them in a hot smoker, um, and that's optional. You don't have to have a hot smoker to make bacon, but it, a smoky mm. flavour in bacon is delicious. That's the whole idea. Smoke it. <laughs> yeah, it is. So we smoked those for about thirty minutes, and then we put it in an oven and we cooked it low and slow, and that made beef bacon. And I tell you, it's almost better than uh, pork bacon. It's delicious. Wow. Nice. So what have you got? Well, Richard, today starts a series of recipes for U.S. Thanksgiving. Oh, that's my favorite uh, yeah. holiday from America. Me too. Yeah. I just eat yeah. everything. I, I miss Thanksgiving. It was the, the one event that I feel that was unique about America that Australia has never really had. W what we have is we have a day called Boxing Day, which is the day after Christmas. Yeah. And that's when all, all your family come and visit and you eat leftovers and you watch sport. Right. So it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of like Thanksgiving. <laughs> Sort of. Well, yeah. uh, and the Canadians do it in October. They have their Canadian Thanksgiving in October. Yeah, but there's specific foods for Thanksgiving, isn't there? There are. And here are the typical foods, right? A roasted turkey. Mm -hmm. If you're Italian, however, they do lasagna. Really? Yeah. Huh. But I'm talking about early Thanksgiving. I'm talking about your traditional sure. turkey, stuffing, mashed potatoes, squashes, mm. uh, veggies oh, yeah. like Brussels sprouts or beans. Yeah. Um, you know. There's a harvest food, right? Yeah, it's harvest food. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I won't get into the history of Thanksgiving. I'm just going to talk ah. about the food. So mm. I thought about this and what would be the most obvious place where 
you're going to miss carbs the most stuffing of course i mean mashed potatoes okay but we can do a cauliflower mash and approximate it but stuffing is one of those things that's like oh geez how am i going to do stuffing Mm. so the answer is Mahler's low carb bread (laughs) (laughs) it's often the answer i've noticed (laughs) yeah and uh yeah, yeah i've stopped eating a lot of that stuff um just low carb breads and in general, but here's one thing that's interesting. Remember that whole controversy about how many grams per slice? Yeah. One of the bags that I had said there was one gram per slice. Sure. I just got another bag or a couple of bags and they say four grams per slice. Oh, no. So, I don't so even, you've I, really got to, you got to just assume it's four grams. I got to assume it's four and it was a misprint before. All right. And I'm not going to give you any hard numbers here because I found that my best food comes when I eyeball it. And I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. You want exact (laughs) amounts, just experiment. You'll know, right? So the first thing I do is I cut up mushrooms and carrots and celery. Right. And I saute that in butter. So it's like a mirepoix, right? It's a mirepoix, except that I don't use onions. If you want to use onions, go ahead, but they're a little higher in carbs, especially when they caramelize. Yeah. So I don't do that. I do I use onion powder, however, mm, and I put some right. salt and pepper in there, but a whole stick of butter, you know, maybe four cups of chopped vegetables, maybe. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm guessing. Mm. And then you want to take some Mahler's low carb bread and toast it. How much? Mm. I don't know. How much is in a bag <laughs> of stuffing? Maybe a whole loaf, maybe a half a loaf, maybe right. Nine pieces, 12 pieces. I I don't know. Just try it and toast it up nice and crisp. Okay. Mm. And then you want to chop it into croutons. So cut it both ways until you get these little squares. Yeah. Now I want you to go buy some herbs, some fresh sage Mm -hmm. in particular, but also a little bit of thyme, a little bit of rosemary. Chop that up, throw that in your mirepoix. Mm. Now take some sausage some sage sausage jimmy dean makes a really good sage sausage Mm -hmm. and you know crumble that up and and fry that and add that in now you need some bone broth and i would use bone broth or you can use chicken stock it doesn't really matter but if you buy chicken stock buy it without salt yeah because you want to add your salt into taste yeah yeah i want to add your salt to taste exactly so the whole idea is you heat up, once the mirepoix is all sautéed and uh, nice and translucent. It's reduced down, yeah. You add the chicken stock to that and warm that up. And then you pour all of that onto, with the sausage, onto your croutons. Mm -hmm. And mix and mix and mix and mix and mix. And how much, yeah, you're going to have to just eyeball it. I'm sorry, but uh, Mm -hmm. I, I always eyeball. I've never, ever made stuffing from a recipe. I just I bought. I, I guess it's not. It's not really not going to matter. It's no. not going to matter. The ratio is not going to matter. No. Um, you put more gonna, stuff in. You're going to have more stuff. Yeah, and you don't need a lot if you. If you, this is something to feed both your carb conscious and carb ignorant. That's right. Family members. Yeah. Because they're not going to know the difference. No, they're not. Yeah. I made it last night and it was so good. Now my mm. wife, she loves stuffing. In fact, at Thanksgiving she doesn't eat turkey. She eats stuffing. Right. That's it. Yeah. Give me some stuffing. You actually use it to stuff the bird or do you just cook it in the pan? Well, last night I cooked it in the pan. But how I normally do it on Thanksgiving is, yes, I stuff the bird, but I also leave some outside the bird because it gets really crispy and golden delicious. Yeah, all the fat rendering off the bird. Yeah, Mm. that crispy stuffing is, is just absolutely wonderful. Nice. If it doesn't have enough butter, add some more. Mm, oh, there's butter. one ingredient that I forgot to mention in the stuffing. Okay. Garlic. Garlic. Crushed yes. garlic to taste. Yeah. Four or five cloves, maybe. You, do you put that in while you're making the mirepoix or you put it in at the yeah, end? Yeah, I put it in a little bit after the mirepoix has started because I don't want the garlic sticking to the bottom of the pan and burning. Sure. 
So and you and you, and you want to cook out the heat a little bit in the garlic. Yeah, mix through the mix. Yeah, You're right. Sure. Yeah, you do want to nice. cook it, but it, essentially this is going to be over low to low medium heat. So you're not yeah. going to heat it up so hot that anything's going to stick and burn. Nice. And of course, you know, a whole stick of butter because yeah. yeah. Oh, olives too. I got a can of black <laughs> olives. I can't believe I forgot the olives. Obviously, I don't have the recipe in front of me. This is one of the downsides of winging it, kids. Yeah. Um, yeah, a can of sliced black olives, throw those in there. And that just adds a little more fat and a little more salt and just lovely. Mm, nice. Yeah. yeah. That sounds good. So, that's what I got, Richard. That's awesome. Well, that's uh, I'm going to actually try that recipe. So, I need to get a turkey, though, because it's very difficult to get turkeys in Australia. <laughs> yeah. I'll ship one to <laughs> try you. Try it with an emu. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> try and stuff. Here, birdie, birdie, birdie. The problem, birdie, with, birdie. <laughs> uh, no, the, the problem with stuffing an emu is they're fast buggers. <laughs> Uh, you need to get a rocket launcher. Yes. So, of course, if you have anything that you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something you don't agree with, or some more research that you found to support or refute anything we've said, send it by email to dudes at 2 com or post it on our website. And you can follow us on Twitter at 2 dudes, on Instagram at 2 dudes, And, of course, if you want to join our Facebook community, it's fb2 com. Our recipe archive is at recipes.2keto.com. Our critical links are at links.2keto.com. Our blog is at blog.2keto.com. <laughs> if you're interested in the retreat next year, it's at retreat.2keto.com. And our booklet that we wrote to sort of describe the ketogenic diet yeah. in a nutshell is at booklet.2keto.com. <laughs> Keep calm and keto on, Richard. You know what, Carl? Get stuffed and keto on. Yeah. <laughs> Get stuffed. We'll see you next time on Two Keto, keto Dudes. Dude.